So, so when you took the the, the, the Australian women's job in in '94, Tom, um, I'm sure it looked a little different from what it is today. You know, the world and what you inherited, the infrastructure, the resources, the you know, the support, and you know, it, it is it is what did that look like then, and and how did you go and you know approach that? Very different, and it, it wasn't just that part of the job, but it was a part of the job where at that stage where women's football was. Um, to actually leave men's football to go into women's football was kind of, uh, people found a little bit incredulous because at, at that particular time, I was, I was actually, I was, I was doing, I I'd kind of doing two coaching jobs. I was coaching at the men's program at the Institute of Sport, which was yeah. essentially the men's youth team, you know, and at that stage, uh, Matt Paducah, Craig Moores and all that, that was that. That's place that is. That, yeah. and, you know, not even... Mark Paduka and Craig Moore, but that's where Jason D, Adam, you know, um, yeah. the golfer, all the, you know, they, they all went there, and that was the that was the the, the cream of the crop through the Australian yeah. system. So I was there, but I'd, I'd been allowed leave there to go and coach a team called Sydney Olympic in the men's national league. Yeah. So I took the, that team. So I was at, actually at that particular juncture, I had, uh, which is often rare, I had an opportunity to do to either go back to the Sydney Olympic which is a, a Greek team in the Men's National League, yeah. which is a rather unstable job, let me say. <laughs> um, <laughs> and go back to the Institute, work with a guy called Ron Smith, who is a legend in coaching in Australia. And, um, and then the women's job came up. And, and I went for the women's job because what actually happened was that was women's soccer, or football, that, or soccer at that time, football, had just become an Olympic sport. And Australia had just been awarded the 2000 Olympics. So virtually overnight, women's football became eligible for government funding. Right. So prior to that time, women's football was literally, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, when people talk about a kitchen table organization, it was literally kitchen table, no money, a group of people who were really diehards keeping the game alive. Yeah. Um, when the, the girls played for the national team, they actually had to pay their own way. There was, there was no funding whatsoever. You literally had to fundraise or pay your own way, take your time off work, et cetera, et cetera. So overnight, the sport changed. Yeah. And the government suddenly put in, I think it was somewhere like a million dollars a year for a women's football program. So that was the part of the job that actually appealed to me. It was actually starting something from, from scratch. So we had to put together virtually a national team, underage national teams, uh, the budget to put some full-time coaches in the different states and then to set up a camp-based program. So it was actual, it was a, the totality of the job that really appealed to me, actually setting something up from scratch. My big brother at the time, he virtually didn't want to speak to me for six months. He was like, well, you know, I shamed the family going in from men's football to women's football because yeah. that's kind of where the profile was yeah. at a yeah. particular time. Um, so it was... It, it, could be, well, I think it was a degree of a risk, but again, it's one of those things where really the, the job really appealed to me and my instincts felt like, you know, this is something I'd really enjoy doing. And I did, I really enjoyed was it. Was that something that you, you know, were maybe challenged by through your earlier years about taking the choice going down the women's route? You know, is, is that, did you ever second guess that because it was, you know, it wasn't, it didn't have the profile of the men's game. Did you ever second guess that choice? Because sometimes you may end up being pigeonholed in that direction. Yeah, I, it, there was a risk of that, of me going in. And um, and like you say, suddenly you're out of men's football and that's, you know, yeah. that's you, you've gone in that regard and it, and it could have gone south. But yeah. I, just, I just felt that the actual appeal of setting something up from scratch really, really, appealed to me and, and it was it was great and it, it was it was difficult but it was a really good challenge yeah. at, at the time but the, I, I, I didn't really bother about the risk factor because to be honest I think if you're going to go into coaching one of the things and I say this to young coaches you've got to take risks yeah. you've got to at times go down pathways that you might not want to go down or it might not be perfect yeah. um, and, I, and I just felt that at this time again more instinct than than logical judgment that this was a, a job that I would enjoy doing and, yeah. and it appealed to me. But why, you know, what, what a leap of faith that was as well. And let's, let's jump forward a little bit, obviously, into um, 
October 2012, when when you were you were appointed um, the head coach of the, the best women's team in the world, and and you know you landed there and and um, probably the highest profile job in in the women's game. Um, talk us through that a little bit, and and you know how, where you, that 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 how that journey took you there, and yeah. the kind of roller coaster that you went through taking that job. Because I'm sure again that was another you know moving country, um, you know kind of relocating and, and taking over a super high profile job. Yeah, that worked out well too. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> um, it, it's interesting. I, I'd actually been approached for the, the job in 2007, just after the World Cup. Right. But I'd just come back into the Matilda's job and then for a couple of years, and it would have been, a, I felt, a poor thing to do yeah. from a Matilda's perspective at, at, at that time. It just wasn't the right thing. And then they came back in 2012. And, and to be honest, um, I was... I was semi-conflicted about taking the job because, you know, I had just sort of built up the programme in Australia and we were in a really good place. Yeah. Um, I was sitting on a, a new four-year contract ready to go, so I had stability there. I was in a, an organisation that allowed me basically to, to run the, the, the team and, the, you know, that part, women's football part. So, I, you know, from a job perspective, there wasn't a better job in the world than yeah. the Australian job. There really yeah. wasn't. Um, the, the thing that, that pushed me towards taking the US job was, it was probably more a, a personal thing in the sense of a challenge to myself and saying, like, the, the easy option was the Australian option. And I kind of felt like, you know, I've come all this way in my coaching journey and taking risks along the way. Yeah. If there's ever going to be a chance for me to, to take that risk again, it was going to be then, because it was unlikely to be any time after that. Do you feel that you have become stale, or do you feel that you know, you've know been maybe in your comfort zone, maybe? Yeah, I felt I'd become comfortable. Yeah. Um, and I think it was a, a good op opportunity then to, to get out of that comfort zone and challenge yourself again. Yeah. What was your mindset going in there? Because obviously, you know, originally when you took the, the, the Australian job, you you know, you had a blank slate and, and you were yeah. you know, you were the you were the you were the quarterback and you could you know you could literally pull all the strings and you go from that perspective to the you know the the, the best women's team in the world and, and and the exposure and and you know what was your kind of mindset going into that at all? Well, my, I, it probably should have been different than it was. My mindset going in was it, it just going into like I've done in other jobs in the sense of I've kind of, like I say, had a variety of jobs along the way, you know, whether it's been men's Croatian team, uh, men in, in Japan and, and things. Yeah. So I've gone into a whole range of different environments and I've kind of been able in, in general to, to assimilate into to that environment. I probably should have done a couple of things differently going into the American environment, which was probably different than the other environments I've gone into in the past. And, um, you, know, I, I, you know, I probably should have brought my some of my own staff in right. so that I had people that this is, this is my way. But in saying that, in the past, I've gone into uh, clubs and, and jobs where there's already been people in positions and, yeah. and it's just gone with the flow, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, so I found that that little bit of the job, I, I had to, I, I should have done that bit better. Right. I, I found a struggle to find an assistant coach and, and, and get all that part together yeah. as well as I should have. And that, that's a fault. I mean, I don't know about other coaches, but I'm, I kind of very um, uh, critique myself uh, since I've been in a coaching job, what I've done well, what I've done badly. Yeah. And um, like most coaches focus on what I've done badly. And there were some things that I, I should have gone into that job with and, and done better and brought more of, rather than me going into that job and trying to fit in, yeah. I should have gone into that job and saying, this is how I wanted to go. And I didn't do that well enough, yeah. um, if I'm being perfectly honest with and myself. And what did you find, Tom, you know, and, and, and I love your honesty, is, is what did you find... You know, as, as you're coming from Australia, you're coming into, you know, a, a super high profile position. 
Um, what were your er earliest challenges or your earlier challenges as you uh, you tried to, you know, again, you were coming to a new culture and, and you were trying to, you know, and you'd spent so much time in, in Australia just understanding that, you know, the youth soccer pathway and understanding all the moving pieces of, yeah. of the US soccer system. What did you find where, you know, that I believe that's a big challenge for anybody coming in from the outside is understanding all the moving pieces of US, you know, the pathways. What did you find were your earlier challenges as you tried to get your feet under the desk, so to speak? Um, I think a few earlier challenges. One, one was um, was kind of the system. So yep. in Australia, we had a really flexible system. So we could, we could kind of do what, what I could do basically what I wanted to do in the sense of if I wanted to bring four different players from here or do this from there, I could do it. The, the structure in America was very, very different to that. Um, so it was a bit more challenging to have the, the fluidity, if you like, of, of um, responsibility that I had uh, in Australia. So there, there was, it, was, it was difficult to, um, not to make changes such, but to, to do certain things that, you, that, I could, that I took for granted that I could do. Yeah, in, and in did Australia. you have, you know, your, your group of players that you had that time, and I, I remember that group of players, and you had a, you know, an established group of players, you're maybe your senior players, and then, and then you had, you know, a, a, a dynamic younger set coming through. Um, you know, did you look at the, the talent base before you took the job? Did you weigh up the, you know, the, the players and the availability, or was that a, was that a factor? No, not really. No, right. no. Right. I, I think, and I, I didn't look and say because did, a lot of the younger players that I, I brought into the the team along that that period, I, I hadn't really known known at all. Yeah. So I known a lot of the senior, obviously, virtually all of the the, the senior players, and yeah. um, and uh, had sort of I, I coached some of them previously from when I was in the club coach in the US. So so yeah. I had I had I had that. I, I didn't know any of the younger players. So that, that, that bit didn't really yeah. influence my, me taking the job one, one way or another. And you certainly had an understanding of, you know, from, from your time in New York. Uh, I'm sure you, you know, you, and, and that was um, even the old WUSA, that, 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 that didn't really last very long, but, but I'm sure you had a, you know, a little insight based on, you know, your experience of that league at that time because all of the big players were playing at that time. Yeah, they were, and I and I think I think the thing is that the system and and how uh, football is is kind of run and perceived in things in America is slightly different. It's hard for me. I can't kind of put it in words, but it is slightly different yeah. than it is in other parts of the world, and yeah. and and they do things slightly slightly differently organisationally. But even even in the football sense, you know, and, um, so it, it's kind of like um, as the same. One of the challenges that I felt that I had in America that I, that I, that I haven't had in other places is, is was just getting um, the way I, I coach and the way I managed across within that US structure. Not just within, not just the players. The players actually, I mean, I think had a pretty good relationship with with most of the players. Um, you know, just the the, um, the the staff situation was different. Um, and, and the management was was different. So U.S. soccer was very different than the environment that I had, I had come from. And I'd come from a really, you know, tight knit group of staff to a um, a, a, a start. Like I work better in a, a kind of team environment. If yeah. I'm, yeah. Uh, you know, some coaches work in an environment where it really doesn't matter who they're working with or whatever. It's just like, well, this is how I work. This is what you do. And da -da. I'm I'm a very much a collaborative kind of kind of guy and, and, and things like that. And, and that's to say, I come from a, a, you know, you think back in hindsight now, uh, in a situation in Australia where I really had a, a fantastic environment in that sense into one that wasn't quite the same. Yeah. And, and I didn't manage that well enough, quickly enough. Um, you know, because in the past, I've never really had that kind of challenge to do it. I always felt that, you know, if I'd been given more time, yeah. Then you know, then I would have, I, I would have done that. Yeah. But uh, you know, as I say, one of the, the the things that I made that I think was a mistake for me was me trying to fit into them rather than say this is how I want it to fit or how I want it to work. 
yeah, yeah. Did you have any, you know, even in that that fairly short period, did you have any highlights from that time, you know, as a team or, you know, as a coach or, you know, as, as you got bedded in? Did, did, do you look back, were there any, you know, highlights that you look fondly upon of maybe small wins or progress that you made or, you know, some, some particular battle you might have won? Um, I, yeah, I, I didn't know that many sort of battles. I think, when, again, in, in hindsight, when I look, look back, it was, it was much, the, the, the NWSL has changed the environment quite significantly in time. The NWSL was just starting out at, at that time. Um, so it was, it was really, the system made it really difficult to, to bring in other players because you had contracted players and you had players who were either could be injured on pregnancy leave or whatever who were still contracted. So you're limited to what you can do. You're limited to the number of times you could actually bring non-contracted players into camps and things like that. So you, so you had those kind of limitations. But if I, if I look back, I mean, we won the Algarve Cup, but that's, I, don't, I don't necessarily look at that you win something, that's, that's an achievement. Yeah. I think um, in, in some cases I felt I was getting the team to play the way that I felt we had to start playing yeah. because the, the, the world game was getting much closer. Yeah. But the other thing when I look back in hindsight, I mean, Julie Ertz or Julie Johnson, she was there, uh, Sam Mewis, uh, Morgan Bryan, um, uh, Crystal Dunn, yeah. uh, you know, I brought all those players in and, and, and and through the system at that time, and they've gone on to be significant players. And uh, and, um, players, players now. Yeah, and all become significant players in the national team. So in some ways, if I look back at time and if I got more time, yeah. I'd have been able to develop them and perhaps more players yeah. through the system a little bit earlier. Yeah. And you see you had a crystal ball here, and, and, you know, and you were looking down the future of... of um, the league and, and all that. Is there many, you know, how would you, how would you approach it if you were given the reins to, you know, run the league in the US? And certainly they've tried the WSA, you know, NWSL had a very different look and feel. Um, you know, from your journey and your experiences, is would you come at it in a different direction, Tom? Well, I think when it started, it was hard because there, there, there wasn't a lot of interest in, in a women's professional league. It was really, really tough it was really difficult so the the thing the interesting thing is when I I left the land there was getting the balance with the the MLS clubs now starting to come in and the single entity owners who started the league and put their blood sweat tears and money (laughs) they lost into it and you had a real sort of and it's still it's kind of still at that cusp of a a turning point I, I think for the league to go forward I think in reality the connection with the MLS it, for me, is a, is a way to go, because you've got resources, you've got a, you've got stadiums, you've got a, a ready, you've got a club structure that's already that's already in place, and you've got stability. Yeah, uh, I think the, the the challenge with the, the women's league is that the you know financially it was a, it was a real struggle, yeah. and and I, I take my hat off to these guys and women who put their time, effort, energy, and money in to actually take a punt and start in the league. So at the, at the time that I was kind of leaving, there was this debate where there was sort of half single entity owners, sort of half MLS owners, and you had the MLS owners saying, we need to put more money into this. We need to take this game forward. We need to do this. And then the single entity owner saying, like, I'm strapped here. I'm doing everything. We need to keep the salary cap as it is, etc." But I think as it goes forward, it's got to start, you know, the reality is now that Europe has awoken in women's football is that the competition is, is huge now. Yeah. And, and um, you know, there's still a great um, uh, sort of kudos about playing professionally in America. But financially, the, the league has to start to make strides forward so it can start to compete and start to continue to compete and get the best players in, you into the some, league. You know, you look at Sam Kerr. You, you look yeah. at some of the top players that are all of a sudden going in that direction. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that Kim Little, who was here for, you know, I think she was yeah. here for a couple of years and, and was yeah. probably the league MVP for one or one or two of those years. And, and they're all kind of going in the other direction again because you can yeah. see, as you say, the stature, the infrastructure, the resources. Um, yeah. 
profile of everything. You know, yeah. and, and I'm sure, you know, is, is, is uh, you and I were obviously at the, the Women's World Cup last year and, and you know, I was, I was in France for, for nearly three weeks myself and, and you know, for, for, my, for my punishment, I went to all the Scotland games and, and just loved the experience as a very proud Scot. You know, there was nothing like going to that England game down in Nice and, and giving them a good run for the money. And, and you know, the Argentina game was just typical Scotland. And, no, but, but just as a, proud Scot, as a proud Scot, and I'm sure I actually went, emailed you back and forth while I was there. And I'm sure, you know, you probably had one eye in Scotland there as well. Oh, 100%. Yeah, yeah. You touch with Shelley. Yeah. So good. I think you just need to make a wee bit of a difference here. I was actually working over there. You were having a bit of a jolly. I was. Yeah, just want to clarify that. Having a jolly was an understatement, Tom. I was, <laughs> I was, I was there with the Tartan Army. Yeah. Uh, the, the England game was brilliant. Absolutely loved it. And, and especially because of, you know, where England have gone in women's football over the last, you know, four, five, six years. We Phil Neville and the stature and, the, you know, they put a lot of investment into the club. And it was... It was great for us, the Scots, as the underdogs, to take England on, and you know, yeah. and, and the ultimate. It was a good, good game. It, it was. Yeah, they got stitched by the VAR, Scotland. Unfortunately, that was it. That that was the one that, that really killed them. Um, but but as a proud Scot, you know, it was it was great to be there. But I'm sure, you know, how did you find the experience? Obviously, you were grafting, you were working there, but you know, to think of your last near thirty years in the women's game to go to an experience like that. You know, and you, I think it was the USA France game. Do you remember the USA France game? Yeah. That yeah. was the game. There was a sellout, and the tickets were going for, for crazy money. And and when you see that in the women's game, I felt that was a benchmark of where the game has come. I think I think it's fair to say that this was the first what I'd call global women's world cup. Yeah. You no. Know? Yeah. And you can have Megan Rapinoe having a Twitter spat with Donald Trump, and it making you yeah. know headlines throughout the world. That that kind of shows that the game yeah. had arrived. And I think, uh, so I think it's taken, uh, that was another big step forward for the game. And, and I think that the, the benefit of that is that, um, you know, it, it starts to get taken more seriously. So you, the critique becomes more yeah. serious. So they, they, yeah. you have to improve all the stuff you're doing yeah. around the game. It's not, not good enough to say, well, that was a good effort from the girls today, da, da, da. You know, it starts to now. You start to you start to actually now get into the what I would call the professional stage of women's football. And and you know, as you said, the the the, the global awareness, the global perspective. I was at the thirteen nothing game, and 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 it was funny because there was such a public outcry about yeah. you know the score getting run up and the celebrations at the thirteenth goal. And I remember watching American TV the next day, and 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 the reaction and the celebrations. Um, was getting discussed on the Today Show, the morning Today yeah. Show, you know. So it hit prime time, and and it wasn't even the game. It was it was the you know the thirteen nothing, the celebrations, and and the perception worldwide of that. And and it told you that women's soccer was you know in, in the conversations. Yeah, exactly. And I think that the the good thing now with the the rise of, of club football in leagues, it's in the conversation now regularly. You know, you know, one thing I used to find, particularly in the Australian job, is that um, we would have spells of popularity. So, you know, you go to a major, like the 2007, 2000 Living World Cup, the team did relatively well at those World Cup. So you'd be the flavour of the month. Yeah. For the month. Yeah. <laughs> and then it would, dis it would dissipate. Now, you know, with the, the, the league, you know, starting to become more professional and the game getting a higher profile, now you're starting to get regular you know, sort of um, publicity, you know, it's, it's, it's there. It's not just the occasional event. Yeah. And how would you say, when you look at your journey, Tom, how would you say um, your style and your, your leadership, you know, qualities, how, do, how would you feel that you've evolved through the years? You know, when you look back and self-reflect and, you know, look at your journey and, and maybe your forks in the road and, you know, to where you've came from, to where you are now, how would you say your you know, your style has changed or evolved? Um, I don't know if my style's changed. I think what has changed is, well, well it, it, I've changed a bit because I think you go into coaching with certain ideas and certain ideals um, of this is how, like, I've this is what coaching is. 
as you evolve, what, what I've found is that you actually have to be yourself. You have to be how you are. Yeah. Um, and that's, the, you know, and you need a, a mix of different characteristics in, in amongst that. You know, I think, um, and, and you can't be somebody else, although you might have some of those, but you still need to have some of those characteristics and some of that decision making. What I've found is I've got uh, older and more experienced, for want of a better word, is that I've got, I think, a better knowledge of how I am and then being able to make that work yeah. for me better. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not an authoritarian, yeah. in your face, yeah. you know, Alex Ferguson hairdryer. Yeah, kind of, kind of coach and, and yeah. things like that. So I've got to work with how I work, but there's still certain things you have to do with within that, yeah. that you know, the decision making and being honest with players and, and all those kind of stuff. But you've you, you've got to bring your own character, personality, and 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 the way that you do things as as best you can. Um, do you think you know where you are today and and the, the accomplishment? Do you think a, a lot of that came from the streets of Milton? I think a lot of I think your grounding comes from there, and yeah. and I think your understanding of people and your understanding of perspective yeah. comes from there. And, and uh, your work ethic and your you know you you, look ethic, at the yeah. that you were probably given there, and and you look back and reflect, and and you really I'm sure you really appreciate what that gave you. Yeah, and how you connect with people, and how you you can uh, I suppose read people to a sense. Yeah, spot, spot the chancer. <laughs> um, so, um, I, I, I think it does. I think that, as I say, and I still get that when I go home with my family. Is, you know, you're both leveled down straight away, and um, uh, so uh, it's kind of. I, I think that that definitely helps. You, you know, you don't overtly think it, but you know, you when you go back in time, you think that that certainly that upbringing. In that working class upbringing in Glasgow and probably north of England and, and things like that yeah. certainly help you be grounded and, and give you you know the work ethics and, and sort of the standards and things yeah. that you, you try to adhere to and the honesty yeah and and you know and, and such a key part of it Tom well this has been an absolute pleasure and I know you've got to get out and, and uh, get your exercise today. You're going to the bike, I'm assuming, aren't you today? I'm going out my bike, yeah. I can't jog. The knees are a wee bit dodgy. I can't jog too much oh, anymore. Oh, that's, that's the old battle scars there, Tom. Well, we, we can't thank you enough for joining us. Again, it's always a pleasure and, you know, I'm looking forward to the next time we cross paths. But it's been an absolute pleasure to sit down with you, Tom, and, and hope this, this coronavirus uh, gets on its way out pretty darn soon. But just... You know, thanks for taking the time with us and, and just love sharing your stories and, and so appreciate it, Tom. No, it's, it's, it's my pleasure. I'm glad you're still awake, Eric. I'm glad I've kept you awake. So, no, it's been brilliant to talk. It's great to, to get back. And Fantastic, a, Tom. Look too. forward to seeing you the very next time and I'll have that calm away for an iron brew for you, Tom. All right, thanks. <laughs> thanks again. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.